Black Squirrel Radio. I'm Boston Bob, back again. You cannot get rid of me. This is not... Oh, let me change the title just for Jacob so he has to add another word when he types this out. This is still not your typical Fairweather sports show with weird squeaking sounds coming from the microphones. <laughs> I, you know, when I was on this show alone, I never had weird squeaking sounds. But then I came in and screwed everything up. Which reminds me, I have a new co-host all semester long. The Clevelander, the candy man, Nick Hershey. Say hello. What's up, everybody? You may have recognized my voice, and you may remember me from the gauntlet, but unfortunately, my co-director, Justin, and I have taken a step back from our show, so I was glad to help out my good friend, Boston Bob, as we will be bringing you still not your typical Fairweather sports show every week, Saturdays, 2 to 4. Let's get started right away. All right, Nick. Now, you're Clevelander, right? Dang right. So you're a big Cleveland sports fan. All day, every day. So Browns, Cavs, Indians, uh, maybe the Monsters. Do you? Yes, I, I've been to a few Monsters games. I have to say they're very entertaining. I mean, hockey's always been entertaining to me, but getting to see a Monsters game or, or two has been a really enjoyable experience. So, yeah, you could say I'm a Monsters fan. Okay, I'll wean you on the hockey if you weren't anyways. So. All right. Now, Nick's going to help me out with college sports all semester with <laughs> that stuff because <laughs> I'm not the big college sports fan, but Nick, Nick's a, a very intelligent sports guy anyways. Plus, you follow college sports, don't you? Yes. You're I, sitting here in a Kent State jersey with the Kent State laptop. And, well, that's because I have, other, uh, I have other things to do after this show, but we'll get into that. Oh, yeah. The game tonight. All right. <laughs> You'll have to stay tuned to figure out who we play, though. Or you just look it up on your iPhones. Yeah, you could do that. But <laughs> do, do the more fun thing and listen to us until we reveal it. Now we're gonna we were off had a little hiatus over winter break, but we're gonna catch you up on everything that we missed really quick here. Well, not really quick. I may I may just draw this out because I love the sound of my own voice. <laughs> now, first thing we'll start off with is OSU. Not only did they win the first college playoff ever, but they did it in convincing fashion, blowing out Wisconsin, blowing out Alabama, and blowing out Oregon. But that's not all. They did this all with their third-string quarterback. And as a Buckeyes fan, it feels great. It really does. No, I believe it. My friend and I, we smoked victory cigars last night. Me for my Pats and him for his Buckeyes. Better late than never. Well, we put it off for the Ohio State one because I didn't want to smoke a cigar prematurely for the Pats. Okay. I didn't want to risk it. Okay. Uh, I know. Well, I'll tell a story real quick. Uh, Pee Wee was a kid watching the 86 World Series with his old man. Uh, Sox are playing the Mets. Right. And uh, he got out the champagne uh, oh. when the Sox were about to wrap it up. Not opening it. He wasn't opening it. All of a sudden, the inning's extending. The Mets tie up the game. And right before the ball before uh, goes through Buckner, the warmth from his hands made the cork pop out and the champagne came out. Ooh. So technically, my old man Pee Wee is the reason the Sox blew the 86 World Series. So it's not Buckner. No, it wasn't Buckner. It's it's Pee Wee. All right. It's, well, uh, it's Pee Wee. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, Winston, Jamise Winston, had the fumble of the year that rivals the butt fumble. No, I I disagree with that. That's it really? is fun. It's funny to watch, but nothing. If it gets worst of the worst for I don't know how many weeks that Mark Sanchez's infamous butt fumble got. I mean, it had to be close to a year, but. Jameis Winston's fumble did not rival that at all. Really? It, sh it should have, but still funny nonetheless, and I wanted to see Florida State lose anyway. So, I do think the butt fumble's a lot better because Chung picks it up and returns it, and right. it's Mark Sanchez in New York with that, that clown of a franchise with the circus that revolves around that team when Rex Ryan was at the helm. Right. Uh, but what I love about the Jameis Winston one, he wasn't even touched, and he just throws it backwards. And he juked everyone, including the referee who falls down trying to keep up with the play. Right, right. That was I. I loved it, and I loved seeing Florida State lose. See, I. <laughs> oh, that it really is a tough call because I. I don't know. I just it seems uncanny to me how a quarterback can run into his own offensive lineman and fumble the ball. <laughs> oh my lord! I think he closed his eyes, which explains some of the interceptions he would throw too. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have a Mark Sanchez T-shirt. Being, uh, my dad got it for me. It was on sale for like a dollar fifty, so he got it for me for Christmas. 
left the price tag on because that was basically the gift. Oh. Sanchez apparel going for a dollar fifty. That's wonderful. And I love wearing it. I love it because people are, oh, you're a Jets fan. Me too. Like, no, I'm just making fun of Sanchez. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, hey, he actually did pretty well in his Thanksgiving matchup with Philadelphia this year. Yeah, he's kind of uh, coming along again. I don't know. How is he going to screw this up? Uh, we'll see. He'll figure out a new way to fumble. <laughs> Maybe he'll do the he'll do the Winston. The Winston. Yeah. We're naming it. We're making it a dance move now. That would be great if he uh, does the Winston. The ball comes out of the back of his hand, hits Shady McCoy on the face, right into like, and the ball bounces into the lap of a defender who re- who returns it. Right. We'll see if that happens. That's a very low bar to set. No. I think Sanchez can hit it though. Yeah, I think he could do it. We'll just see if Shady can do it. Right. Although I think Sanchez is a free agent this year, so I don't know if he'll be with Philly or not. Ooh, plenty of teams need a quarterback, including Buffalo. Including Buffalo, Tennessee. Um, well, not the Raiders anymore. Cleveland. That's a shock. That's a shock that I can say the Raiders don't need a quarterback because Derek Carr seems like to be the guy. But anyway, the, the I'm Brownies going to... may need one. We'll we'll just talk about that a little bit more in detail later. Right. <laughs> save <laughs> save it for later. I don't feel like talking about this right at the outset of the show. Now, more football news. The referees had a huge impact on the outcome of not one but two NFC playoff games with uh, ripping off the Lions on the the picked-up flag and then proceeding to even the score by ripping off the Cowboys with the the Des Bryant catch, similar to the uh, Megatron one earlier a few years ago. Right. Uh, that was in the news for a while. Actually, they, they ruled that the Calvin Johnson rule. The Calvin Johnson. Actu- okay. Actually, is what they called it. I believe that's what they called it, yeah. Yeah, that does sound right now. I'll let them hear it again. Absolutely <laughs> amazing and funny at the same time. All right, we're going to whip through some of these real fast. Uh, the Packers lost in an amazing fashion, uh, low in a huge lead. Uh, <laughs> missed the uh, onside kick, was, was fumbled, and uh, but... On the bright side of that, Aaron Rodgers played very well through the calf injury. Indeed he did. Uh, the, was... the Patriots' balls in the AFC Championship were deflated, and that created a hell storm. Uh, the Pats won the Super Bowl over Seattle on an amazing uh, last-minute or last-second interception on a debatable call. Uh, there was that curse catch that was like Tyree Part 2, and then the butler did it in the end zone. <laughs> Uh, there was a brawl at the end of the Super Bowl, uh, and surprisingly, Sherman was not a part of that, and he was a very good sport at the end of the game. Yeah, I'm actually surprised. Well, Sherman's always been uh, kind of a Jekyll and Hyde kind of personality because, of course, everybody remembers his rant after they beat the 49ers in the NFC Championship game where he proceeds to call Michael Crabtree a mediocre receiver and don't ever throw to him on fade routes and <laughs> whatever may have you. And then to come back this year and actually shake the hand of Tom Brady, the first one to do so after the interception that sealed the Patriots' win. That's just class. You can't oh, yeah. teach that. Yeah. I uh, really don't mind Sherman anymore. We got, his, we got our revenge on him. <laughs> All right, real quick. I'm going to rattle off these. Uh, Edelman stole my beard. Goodell <laughs> refused to speak at the Super Bowl, yet we were able to get Obama on the Super Bowl shows. Uh, the Pro Bowl tested new rules with skinnier goalposts, and Adam Vinatieri looked like a little kid trying to kick field goals out there. Uh, Tiger lost a tooth and still sucks at golf. Tavares got ripped off as the NHL All-Star MVP, uh, tying the game record for most goals in an All-Star game, one behind being the lone leader in that, but they gave the MVP to Johansson, the hometown Blue Jacket. Josh Gordon got suspended again. Uh, Manziel checked himself into rehab. Brown's management is a mess again. The Cavs actually started trying to play basketball recently. <laughs> the Knicks are horrible, and it's hilarious. And Pedro was voted into the Hall of Fame on his first ballot. As he should, and I think Randy Johnson got a well-deserved nod there, too. Yeah, definitely. Although I would have voted Randy in the first try, too. Randy Johnson, and I'm waiting for... Uh... I'm waiting for Ken Griffey Jr., my favorite player. Oh, I loved watching him as a kid. Oh, he was the only—he was the only lefty I knew, and I hit lefty back then. He had the most beautiful swing I've ever seen. He still has it. He just doesn't have the bat speed anymore. Or you know the <laughs> fact that he's not even playing anymore. Yeah, well, that's why he doesn't have the bat speed, and he's falling asleep <laughs> in dugouts. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever see his interview with Sports Center? Oh my God, that was funny. 
I feel bad for him because it was painfully awkward, but still funny at the same time. Was it really? Like he wasn't like he wasn't into it at all. Like he, he was just sitting there, and like you could tell he didn't want to be there. He's probably tired. He probably it, it was, was probably a long day. He's been up since like five a.m. Went he, out to the senior citizen breakfast, early you know? bird special. Yeah, and ESPN interrupted him from his mm, nap. Didn't oh. take his nap. He's not getting his raisin pudding. <laughs> you know. Now we uh, promised we talk about OSU football, and you know. I'm a giver. It was a wild year. It really was. I mean, to come in with your Heisman candidate quarterback, Braxton Miller, going down with a shoulder injury, having to trust in this redshirt freshman, JT Barrett. I always get that screwed up. And then coming into our second game, our first home game, if I'm correct, against Virginia Tech and losing, no one could have guessed what would have happened next, especially after JT Barrett goes and accidentally injured him injures himself and we have to rely on this kid from Cleveland named Cardale Jones who not a not a lo- not a lot of people know he's got a rocket for an arm that's mm-hmm. why he's earned the nickname or the appropriate nickname 12 gauge and he proceeded to destroy Wisconsin destroy Alabama and destroy Oregon as well en route to, as we mentioned earlier, Ohio State winning the first ever college football playoff national title. But he had some help right behind him, and it comes in the form of apparently his shirt was too large for his massive body, Ezekiel Elliott, (laughs) who just went on a tear in the last three games of the season to help clinch that title, especially the performance against Alabama and Oregon stand out to me. I think it was very interesting and awesome, the fact that – Cardell Jones took down three Heisman finalists in a row, too. Right. That was pretty cool. In the form of uh, Marcus Mariota, uh, Jake, or Amari Cooper, sorry, and um, Melvin Gordon. Yeah. I believe well. that's Wisconsin's guy. Um, but yeah, I don't know what's up with Ezekiel Elliott's shirt. I don't know why that is. Maybe he just wanted to show the world that he works out. I, don't know. I think he either needs to get a navel piercing. Uh, or wear a full shirt. I don't care for it. It just looks it looks weird. Hey, if he can produce like that on the field, he can roll up his shirt as long as he wants. You if think he, the NFL is going to let him wear a shirt like that? No, I don't think so. But no, if he either. wants, if he wants to stay, if he can stay, although I wouldn't after the season he's had. Mm-hmm. But if he wanted to stay in Columbus, I'd let him roll up his shirt a little bit. Now, is he going to the draft? I believe he is. I'm okay. not exactly sure. Let me search that. But it's just been it's been a great season, and um, now that that's over, I think the biggest question is what's going to be uh, what's going to become of the quarterback position because you have Braxton Miller, who's coming off a medical medical red shirt, I think, or is it a gray shirt? I'm not sure. Yeah. But he he's some still, kind of shirt. He has an additional year of eligibility because of the injury. Then you have J.T. Barrett, who showed a lot of promise before going down himself. But then you have the guy from Cleveland who just recommitted to staying with Ohio State, even though it's going to be the QB picture here, unless Braxton transfers, is going to be as crowded as one could imagine. Who not only took over at the time at the most crucial time in the season when you were fighting for both the conference title and the right to play in the national title and the national title game itself. So it's going to be a big question going forward. And I just want to get your opinion. Who do you think is going to start for the Buckeyes? Because I think it. I think personally, it comes down to Barrett and Jones. Because in my opinion, I think Braxton's going to go look for an opportunity elsewhere. You think Braxton's leaving? I do. Okay. I that's what I think. All right. I always thought Jones would be the one to leave, and I think he should, because he could probably start on plenty of college teams right now. With after that performance he gave last year, Ezekiel Elliott is a sophomore. So I don't think I, I think he's coming back. I'm not exactly sure. I I think the I think the uh rule for NFL draft eligible guys is two years. So he could be back. He should stay. I think he is back. I think he's staying. But anyway Oh, and it looks like their fir- I don't know if this is right, but their first game is apparently against Virginia Tech next year. Ooh. Which is uh which is appropriate i guess at virginia tech so hopefully we can embarrass them in their stadium yeah i think there's going to be a lot on that line for ohio state pride wise yeah i want to get that win 
avenge that loss. Yeah. Although it really didn't hurt them, I guess, this year. Yeah, so. but I mean, I guess I guess by a degree of separation, Virginia Tech can call themselves the champions. Yeah, and so can Kent State. So can Kent State. God, I don't even remember the two teams that are in the middle of it. Akron. I, I don't can't beat Akron, and Akron beat somebody who beat somebody who beat VT. Akron. But I I can't remember. And my friend Jeremy told me this last night, but I was drinking, so I don't remember. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. At least we're being honest. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, what's a cigar without a nice uh, cold Sam Adams? Or two or three or four, you know. <laughs> it was our celebration of the Pats and Buckeyes winning it all. So <laughs> I know for me it's like a celebration every year because my teams are successful. But right, for him, right. it was kind of like a one-time thing because he was too young to well, do any of that when the Buckeyes won in what O two. O two, yes. Yeah. And you see, you know, we we Browns fans do that kind of thing for other reasons. The yeah, exact when, opposite, when you, actually. When your players don't get arrested, you celebrate. No, not exactly. I mean, uh, I guess, I guess she, yeah, you could say that. When they yeah. don't have to check in the rehab. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get to that later. We're jumping ahead of ourselves a little bit. And when Manziel starts, they have to play Amy Winehouse songs. Oh. <laughs> oh. Yeah, but, I mean, aside from the quarterback situation, Ohio State's losing guys like Devin Smith, Michael Bennett, uh... There's a bunch of others, but I can't name them. Oh, and shoot. Now, what do, what do you think about the change topics a little bit? Mariota and Winston. Uh, apparently, Winston's ahead of Mariota in the ranks, but I. What do you think about that? I, mean, it really is a tough call because I I think Jameis Winston has the better frame, to be an NFL quarterback. Let me search up Marcus Mariota to get his exact. Uh, physical stuff. You know, I think Mariota's the easy choice because, I mean, what's the point of having a quarterback with a good frame and that's talented if he can't stay out of trouble and on the field? And right. Winston hasn't proved that he can behave yet. Right, and I mean, that's that's key. Actually, Marcus Mariota is not that bad either. He's 6'4 and 219. He's a big guy. Uh, Winston, I think, is right about in that same height neighborhood, but I think he's got a little bit more weight on Mariota. Let me... Look at that. We've got Mariota at about 215, and yes, Jameis Winston's got him by about 15 pounds. But the intangibles for Mariota are off the charts compared to Jameis Winston because talent talents only can only get you so far in the NFL. Just ask Josh, Josh Gordon. But oh, if you yeah. can't if you can't stay off if you can't stay out of trouble when you're off the field, then teams just aren't going to want you. And I think that's why. Mariota should be above Jameis Winston strictly on I agree. intangibles. Yeah. But as far as talent is concerned, I think it's an even, a pretty even matchup, but I'm going to give the edge to Winston if we're solely talking about talent. I think I'm still giving it to Mariota, but in Winston's defense, he has proven that in a late game, when they need points, he can deliver. Right. Uh, Florida State made plenty, because they were down so much in the third quarter this year, they had to make plenty of comebacks. The only game Mariota was down in was that OSU game, and he, he couldn't lead him to come back. Granted, it's a small sample size because it's only like one game. Right. But you know Winston can lead a team with a comeback. Mariota, you're still not sure. And not to mention, Jameis Winston led his team to a championship in That's his freshman true. year. Because Mariota, who did they lose to? Mari- they lost to Mariota. They did. <laughs> they lost to Mariota and the Ducks. I Okay. On that Mariota... Oh, that puts a gigantic hole in my argument. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, the college football playoff paying dividends in its first year. Oh, yeah. I really enjoyed the, the, the playoff system. Right. And do you think they should expand it to an eight team? I do because it'll make those late games in the season more relevant. Because you guys, I mean, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, hullabaloo, I guess, is what the word I'll use. But Okay, um, Pee Wee. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I remember watching uh, the selection show where they had, you know, Alabama, Oregon, mm-hmm. uh, number three. Um, Florida State was number three. And then there was that fourth spot where you had Ohio State, Baylor, and TCU. And, uh, you know, 
you know, me being a Buckeyes fan, I was really thrilled when I saw Ohio State come up on the fourth spot, but I can't imagine what's going through the minds of TCU and Baylor fans because mm-hmm. the fourth seed ended up winning the title. Yeah, I think if you extend it, it's going to give some of those on the cusp teams a longer season because more of those games will matter down the stretch. Right. You know, you get that third loss, it's a death sentence, but you could still make it with two losses. You right. Just gotta out, not only do you have to win, but you got to outscore some teams. So I think expanding it would, would make it more exciting for me personally. Right, and that one game that stands out to me in my mind was the shootout between TCU and Baylor yeah. in the middle of the season. It's combined for probably about 100 points, if not a little more. Yeah, I, I think we're both on the same page. Eight teams it is. I Yeah, I feel like it's a good call. <laughs> make right. it happen, NCAA. Well, we're going to go to a quick commercial break. Uh, when we come back, we'll talk draft and we'll talk the Browns. But first, I, you know, I have something I really got to say, and not just because I'm being told to. But College Goal Sunday is a free community-wide event helping students and their parents complete the free application for federal student aid, FAFSA. You know, there shouldn't be a period there. The FAFSA is required to <laughs> apply for all federal aid programs as well as some state and institutional programs. Kent State University is one of the, is one of the host locations for College Goal Sunday. To get free FAFSA assistance and speak with financial aid professionals, come to Franklin Hall February 8th from 2 to 4 p.m. Bring your 2014 IRS 1040 tax return and W-2s for student and parents, Social Security card, driver's license, and any other benefit and income information. To register and to come find other locations, go to www.ohiocollegegoalsunday.com Dot org or call 1-800-233-6734. Listening to Black Squirrel Radio, we'll be back. after. Now I'll admit it, I'm a little confused as to what's going on in the draft. So I have my expert here in the studio, Nick Candyman Hershey. Well, I'm no Todd McShay or Mel Kuyper Jr., but uh, let me take a crack at it. So you actually know what you're talking about. Oh, oh. <laughs> but I can't beat Mel's hair. Oh, God, no one can. Maybe Goodell if he got a little more helmety. Maybe a little bit. Maybe. But anyway, um, I know we were talking about college football last segment, and two guys in particular popped up, and that would be former Florida State quarterback Jameis Winston and Florida Oregon Ducks quarterback Marcus Mariota. And currently between three mock drafts on NFL.com posted by Lance Zerline, Bucky Brooks, and Daniel Jeremiah, Jeremiah at I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. All three of them have Jameis Winston going to the Buccaneers at the uh, at the number one overall pick. Okay. I'm actually surprised the Raiders didn't get the number one overall pick, but I guess they had a good start to the end of their season. And uh, I just like to point out that at one point the Buck the Buccaneers at like two and seven or two and nine or something like that were only two games out of the NFC South. I'm just gonna put that in there for perspective. The NFC South. Isn't that good? <laughs> they who were horrid. I can't believe I picked the Falcons to go to the Super Bowl at the beginning of the year. Yeah. yeah. No one would have saw that coming. At least I had the Pats in there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> kind of makes up for uh, such a you you a probably would you probably would have hoped the Falcons would have made the Super Bowl because then it would have probably would have been easier. No, oh, yeah, we could have had like Brady line up and be the running back when we would have won. Right. But nonetheless, we've got um Two-thirds of the consensus number two pick is going to Leonard Williams, the defensive end out of USC, just a terrific defensive player. And following that at number three, the Jacksonville Jaguars on the clock then. We've got three different players being selected from the three experts here. Uh, One has them picking defensive end Shane Ray out of Missouri, Uh, Randy Gregory, uh, the outside linebacker out of Nebraska, and Jeremiah rounds it out with Dante Fowler Jr., the linebacker out of Florida. And at number four, we have the Raiders. Uh, Zerline has them taking uh, Heisman finalist and Alabama wideout standout Amari Cooper, while Bucky Brooks has them taking Shane Ray, the defensive end out of Missouri. And Jeremiah has them taking Kevin White, the wideout from West Virginia. And uh, I'm not too sure... Uh, how Kevin White stacks up against Amari Cooper, but I did look at Kevin White's physical stuff. He is about 6'3 and 210 pounds. His pro comparison would be DeAndre Hopkins, 
of course, the wide receiver of the Houston Texans, former Clemson standout. Um, Amari Cooper, of course, the Heisman finalist. And let me see his physical stuff and his pro comparison. Uh, Cooper stands at 6'1 and 210. And his NFL comparison, this is awful generous, ladies and gentlemen, Marvin Harrison. Oh, wow. Marvin Harrison is his pro pro comparison. Huh. And um, I don't know how I, – I don't know how they come up with that because Marvin Harrison's a Hall of Fame receiver. If he's not in, he should be in. He will be. He will be. And um, for further for further context to this, uh, Ohio State standout wide receiver Devin Smith was compared to Deshaun Jackson, who, of course – is a speedy, effective receiver currently playing with the Washington Redskins, but most memorably his first few years with the Philadelphia Eagles. Yep. But um, <laughs> we're going to move on down the line here to number six, uh, the New York Jets, who are taking the number two quarterback, at least in the minds of most people, Marcus Mariota. Ooh. And if Amari Cooper's not uh, available at number six, apparently uh, Bucky Brooks has them taking Amari Cooper at six. Although I don't know who their quarterback would be because Geno Smith is not exactly producing. No, uh, they need Mariota. They that do need be a good fit. They do need Mariota. But uh, moving on to my guys at number twelve, the Cleveland Browns. A um, lot of guy, a uh, lot of speculation as to if they're going to take a receiver or not. I think they should. They probably should have last year when they had guys like Mike Evans, Odell Beckham, uh, Sammy oh. Watkins. Uh, oh, man. Some uh, there are some other receivers. Marquise Lee, who ended up going to the Jaguars. You know, Gilbert wasn't bad though. Gilbert was not bad. Yeah. He just didn't play enough to give us an accurate sample size. And then there's that whole, oh, you're getting suspended for missing a practice. Mm. But Jeez. anyway, um, Lance Zerline has them taking Kevin White out of West Virginia. I already gave you some details on him. Six three two ten. His pro comparison DeAndre Hopkins. Um, the other two address the lines uh Danny Shelton the nose tackle out of Washington uh coming coming at number 12 as according to Bucky Brooks and David Jeremiah has them taking offensive tackle TJ Clemmings out of the University of Pittsburgh and uh Bob I know I was talking to you about this prior to the show um whereas a defensive tackle would actually be a good thing and that you think that they could use that position. You want to open up about that a little bit more to everybody who's listening? Yeah, as much as I love Phil Taylor, I mean, how can you not like a guy who threw someone out a window? I mean, he's actually come out <laughs> He's come out and said that he wants to retire a Brown, and he's only four years into his pr- career. So, Like, I love Phil Taylor. I just wish he could stay on the field. Uh, he's had a, been bit by the injury bug quite a bit, right? and he's really not progressing the way he should. Granted, you, you could maybe attribute that to so many injuries, but I think the Browns, uh, they either got to draft someone there or, and this is a, a little out there and probably wishful thinking, uh, but, hey, and Dominican Sue's available. Yeah, I was hearing <laughs> that, that they were connected to him a bit, but I don't think Detroit's going to let him go. No, they shouldn't. Uh, yeah, they as shouldn't. they shouldn't. But, I mean, I'd, oh, my gosh, him on the Pats or the Browns, oh, I'd love watching him. Right, but... Oh. Um, Anyway, the Browns also have a pick at number 19 overall, and on that one, uh, Zerline has them taking Jordan Phillips, the nose tackle out of Oklahoma. Um, Bucky Brooks has them taking Jalen Strong, the wide receiver out of Arizona State, and I actually haven't looked at his uh, uh, at his uh, physical stuff, so let me uh, take a look at that for you folks. Well, uh, well, while you look at that, or wait, do you already have it? Yeah, I already have All it. Right, I can shoot. He's uh six three and he's about two fifteen and his NFL comparison is Dwayne Bow. So he's gonna have two good years and then do nothing. Right, <laughs> basically. And uh interesting uh interesting point here. Uh David Jeremiah actually has them uh the Browns taking Devin Smith at the nineteenth overall pick. And I know we got a little bit of a shock when we were talking about it uh, pre-show. Uh, specifically, one guy was in the room like, hey, he's progressing up draft boards pretty well. Uh, Devin Smith goes about 6'1", 210, I believe. Uh, let me. He's a ch- wide receiver, right? Yeah, wide okay. receiver. Yeah, 6'1", um, yeah, oh, about 200 pounds. And again, his pro comparison is Deshaun Jackson, which 
I feel like most of these pro comparisons are generous. Yeah. Except for except for uh DeAndre Hopkins, the DeAndre Hopkins comparison to Kevin White. I feel like they just do that not for like he's gonna put up the same numbers, but just like maybe he's got speed and he's got good hands, but maybe, you know, not a good route runner or stuff like that. Maybe you know, stuff like that. But the one guy I'd like to see them pick up, uh personally if they were to pick up a wide out would be Devontae Parker. Uh six three, two ten. And his NFL comparison, which isn't overly generous, but it's Hakeem Nix. Okay. Uh, he uh, Nix, of course, had a few good years with the Giants. Won a Super Bowl with them. Unfortunately, over the Pats. Got to mention it. Sorry, Bob. Really? Um. All right. Well, we'll mention your downfalls later. Oh well, you've got a ton of those. But um, Nix, of course, now sits in Indianapolis as Andrew Luck's number three receiver. Number two, number three, I don't know. Uh, they, I don't know. They keep finding guys out of nowhere and throwing to them ahead of him. But moving on to one of your, one of your teams here, the Pats. They have them taking, and this is uh, this is David Jeremiah. They have the Pats taking Todd Gurley, who, you know, had a injury plagued history at Georgia, but before the injury was widely considered to be one of the top running backs in the nation. What do you think? Um, I'm he's a wide receiver, right? No, running no. back. Oh, running back. We don't need a running back. We have like a plethora of running backs. I don't know. I I could see us maybe getting a wide receiver because it's we don't need a great wide receiver. We just need someone to maybe like go deep with LaFell right. down the field. Right. Uh, we don't need slot because we have Edelman, uh, and Gronk really covers any like lack of receiving we have. Well, let me uh. But we don't need a running back. Let me check because uh, Zerline actually has your guys taking Devin Funches, the wide receiver out of Michigan. And let me... I'm up for that. Plus, he can play in cold weather. Let me take a look. That's something we look at. At his physical stuff. And, yes, the cold weather definitely being a factor. And it looks like he might be more of a tight end here as his physicals match out at... He stands in at six foot five and weighs about 230 pounds. So I'm thinking tight end more more or less than wide receiver. Uh, although his strengths do say big wide receiver with the ability to mismatch corners in the red zone. And his NFL comparison, and I have never heard of this person before, but it's Gavin Escobar. Hmm. Yeah, I haven't heard of him either. I uh, I don't know who that is, but the bigger the better, I guess. 6'5", 230. That's all, that's all she wrote there. And I do think I do think the cat or not the Cavs, the Browns, the Browns gamble on a quarterback probably in the late third to fourth rounds, mm-hmm. kind of compete with Johnny Manziel, and then they make Manziel that little elf mascot thing, right? They should because he would be perfect for that. They've already got the one with his money sign. Oh, they, so, he he's perfect for it. I think that's why they drafted him. So he would fail and be like the most expensive mascot in NFL history. The most, easily the most <laughs> recognizable and get you a lot of publicity. But so is Tim Tebow, really. That's true. Um, anyway, that that provides us a pretty nice segue for what we're about to go into, and that would be my guys' struggles. And it all the starts. Browns. It all starts or revolves around two guys, and I think you know who I'm talking about. Josh Gordon and Johnny Joe Manziel. Thomas. I mean, uh, Manziel. <laughs> <laughs> we don't talk about Joe that way. You can talk about the. Re- I think he had he had a bad season. He still made I think the he pro- had an overrated season. He still made the Pro Bowl. Yeah, he's still probably the best O lineman you can get. Uh, when you were talking, uh, Pee Wee actually texted in. He thinks the Browns need some more O line depth. Right, and I I think uh, there was one mock draft here that had them addressing that need at number 12. Mm. Although Joel Batonio, last year's second-round pick, seemed to work out pretty well for them. I mean, center-wise especially. When Mack went down, the season was basically gone. Right. I mean, they pulled out a few wins, but not nearly as much momentum as they had. No. And um, you are right, they do have, I think it's David Jeremiah here that has them taking TJ Clemmings out of Pittsburgh. He's a tackle. All right. And then at number 19, yeah, it's that's the only offensive tackle they have them taking in the first round. But <coughs> outside of uh, Thomas and Batonio and Mack, if he comes back, 
well, he will come back just yeah. a matter of when. They definitely do need some help on the O-line. Mm-hmm. But our main concern here is the man behind the line, and that would be the quarterback, which we do not know who it exactly is going to be yet. Um, all indications point to Manziel for right now. Uh, Manziel, of course, grabbing headlines a little bit after the Super Bowl, checking himself into rehab. Uh, my only question is, why didn't you take Josh Gordon with you? Yeah, uh, I mean, maybe that. Yeah. I, I mean, know. it seems like those two would be hanging out a lot, seeing as how their off the field stuff kind of coincides with one another. And for those of you that are listening, I'm sure you know the plethora of off the field incidents that Josh Gordon has had with uh, drugs and alcohol. And Manziel hasn't been particularly shy about his off field stuff either. Um. <laughs> Um, you think? Do you think Johnny checking in the rehab is gonna affect the ability for him to be a starter? See, I, I just don't know because it's hard to tell because we've seen such a limited sample size from him in the uh, last season, and I don't. I mean, this might be a little mean to say, and I'm not trying to knock Manziel and, or anything, but all reports that I've been reading, all the articles that I've been reading about his preparation, his intangibles have been leading me to believe that maybe somewhat there's a long shot that he's entering rehab solely for the purpose of getting his money from the NFL so he can fund his off-the-field stuff. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, it's horrible to say. It's very – I should probably offer an apology. and I I mean, I I am probably going to feel bad about it, but part of me thinks that Johnny's probably doing this so he can get money to fund his parties or whatever. Really? I haven't heard that one yet. It's a it's a, it's a bit of a conspiracy theory. Yeah, like the Lynch one, where Carol didn't want Lynch to get MVP because they'd have to pay him. Right. <laughs> um, but just based on the small sample size we've seen from Johnny and just the reports about his, um, I guess, professionalism, you could call it, mm-hmm. uh, part of me wants to... I mean, part... Of course, I'm hoping for the best that it, this is about salvaging his career and eventually getting into that starting spot. Oh, but yeah. um, the fact that all the articles are saying that he has treated his rookie season as "quote unquote" a joke um, leads me to be skeptical about his true intentions. And jo- as far as Josh Gordon is concerned, I think he's played his last snap as a Cleveland Brown. Um, where exactly he'll end, he'll end up, um, I'm not exactly sure. Whether it's with an NFL team or not, I can't tell you. Mm-hmm. Um, he's definitely the ultimate tale of talent wasted. Yeah. Or at least one that I can remember. It's Be- sad because he's so talented. He's Be- so fast. He's got great hands. He's 6'4", 225, probably about the ideal frame for a receiver. And... Unlike Manziel, we've seen what Josh Gordon can do, albeit that was sam- that was limited as well. But mm-hmm. in the in the uh, l- little time that we did see him, um, uh, he looked a little slow. He did when he came back from injury, but slow. I'm basically I'm talking about uh, the year before that when he basically mm-hmm. led the NFL in receiving yards despite missing two games. And I, that's just, oh, it, it just makes the tale all the, all the uh, worse because at least with Johnny, you don't know, we don't know his potential yet. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I would hope, I would, I would seriously, sincerely hope that Johnny realizes from at least what Josh is going through what can happen if off the field incidents become a problem as if they already haven't somewhat. But. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to stop you right there, Nick. That's I mean no. Josh Gordon's good. But Julian Edelman is one of the best receivers of all time. Of all time. Kanye reference. Yeah. <laughs> we we gotta go to a quick commercial break though. All right. Uh, listening to Black Swirl Radio. This is not your typical Fairweather Sports Show. With me, Boston Bob, and the candy man, Nick Hershey. We'll be back. Black Squirrel Radio. This is not your typical Fairweather Sports Show. I uh, just got some breaking news on ESPN with a score alert. Uh, Duke avenged their loss to Notre Dame by whipping them by thirty. Final score ninety to sixty. Whew. So uh, Bob not very happy right now. Mike Shashesky, the man. Yeah, he's 
the man of a thousand wins. He is quite the head coach. He is quite the head coach. And uh, going from one great head coach to another, that Mike Patton and that Browns organization. Huh? Hey, I, you know what? I will say <laughs> this about Mike Patton. He is the only, he's made it through one year, so he's already better than Rob Chudzinski. I will give him that. <laughs> um, I do like Patton. I really do. Um, you know, he was he was uh, famous for having his victory cigars, much like you, Bob. Oh, yeah. Um, in red. Red hour back. <laughs> Man. But um, he really seems like it. Really seems like the players are rallying around him a lot. I really like him as a coach. And uh, again, if you're just joining us, ladies and gentlemen, I just went into a rant about Josh Gordon and Johnny Manziel. Um, really hope that Johnny Manziel can turn himself around. I had to hold we, him back. We need him. Ooh. We need you, Johnny. I didn't. <laughs> just oh god, just get out here and toss some footballs, throw your money sign, and. When Johnny, one thing you have to learn is that uh, if you're listening, which you know you're probably not, but just in case, Browns fans are so passionate and they take everything to heart. So every little thing that you do, they're either gonna love it or hate it. Right. So and don't don't take offense. Just Browns fans, they're yeah. so passionate. Yeah. And again, from uh from one's brown from one Browns fan, and I probably can't speak for the rest of us. But I do hope that you can come through the rehab program, come back onto the field, and throw some touchdowns, win some games for us. I do too. Come back, Johnny. I don't. I don't. I like Johnny. Anyway, moving on to the front office and everything else. Textgate. <laughs> I don't know exactly what the situation is, but apparently, General Manager Ray Farmer was sending some texts down to the sidelines, and I don't know why. Maybe he was reinventing Spygate. I oh, don't mention that. I don't know. Uh, just another way to do it. I don't know. That's only speculating. I'm sure that's not what it is. But nonetheless, the NFL came down and said, no, 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 not today. And might <laughs> throw down a suspension his way, if, along with a possible loss of draft pick as the nice Matumbo finger wag from Bob over there. <laughs> Classic. Um, yeah, I don't want to lose the draft pick. Don't. Yeah, don't do that. Roger, don't do that. Please don't do that. Um, but it's just, yeah, the Browns need those picks. There's so many mm. positive things to take away from this season. We finally won more than four or five games, finally, and we have a decisive win over the Steelers. Oh yeah, and an, and an almost comeback too. And an almost comeback over one of the AF, AFC's finest, the Indianapolis Colts. And the Steelers, the first game too. And yes, and beat the them twice. Almost Should have beat them twice. Almost swept the Steelers if not for. Um, I can't remember their kicker's name. Sean Sweezum. Oh yeah, he's solid. Sean Sweezum. Sweezum uh, will squeeze him in there. Right. Yes, he will. Anyway, I don't know what Jimmy Haslam's thinking right now, but if he's thinking of cleaning house again for the second or third time, I've lost count. <laughs> do not do it. I don't know. I wouldn't mind if they cleaned house but kept Patton. Yeah, I wouldn't mind that either, but Farmer's only got one draft under his belt, mm -hmm. and that, in my opinion, is not fair, not fair to him because he needs... The biggest problem with this organization has been the lack of stability. Over mm -hmm. 15 years, we've had, what, 22, 23 different starting quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. We've had guys like Brady Quinn. We've had guys like Colt McCoy. Love Colt you, McCoy, Brady. I actually like, and he, he got his fair shot to start until James Harrison decided to come along and just destroy him during a game with the Steelers and he hasn't been the same since <laughs> although he did have his miraculous two-week run with the Redskins where he did win a few games and they had some memes from Sports Nation with his pumped up face <laughs> and the PR guy for the Redskins actually had to pull him away from an interview because he oh that was bad oh I remember that that yeah. was that was made you wonder what else was going on yeah but the yeah. biggest problem with this organization is the lack of stability and Jimmy Haslam really hasn't done much to curb that. He really hasn't done much with the firing of Joe Banner and Mike Lombardi to the hiring of Farmer, the firing of Rob Chenzitsky, as I alluded to earlier, after only one year of coaching. But Petten seems like the right coach for now. And give Farmer another shot. I mean, I know he's in some hot water right now with the NFL. Um... I know he's got a good relationship with Haslam, which may save his job if they're even considering getting rid of him. But give him another shot to have another draft because 
there's no way he's going to pass up on a wide receiver this year. I you can book that. You can put that on the record. He will not miss a wide receiver this year. He will take a wide receiver in the first round. Now, the Browns wide receivers didn't do bad this year. They did not. And a lot of people were expecting them to be have a bad receiving core because of the loss of Josh Gordon. But nothing could be further from the truth and Andrew Hawkins has quietly become one of my favorite receivers on that team right now. Um, I also like Taylor Gabriel. Uh, I like Gabriel too, yeah. But the only thing is, Hawkins and Gabriel don't exactly measure up. They're under six foot. We need a big receiver. We need a guy. We need a guy like Josh Gordon without the red flags. Yeah, that's true. You know, Miles Austin didn't do bad either. Miles Austin did not do too bad, but a little old though. L- yeah, a little bit, a little bit old, and not to mention that. Our prize tight end, Jordan Cameron, allegedly oh. does not want to be here anymore. That's he will sad. seek out more uh, other teams, it seems. And Where's I, he going to go, though? I, there's been some speculation that he might end, wind up in Atlanta, which would probably be the ideal place for him with oh, Matt that Ryan. Would be a good one. They better get a better O-line, though. Right. Because uh, Ryan can't throw when he's getting hit constantly. Right. Uh, but moving on, I don't know... I don't know how to properly assess Cameron's value because when he when he's on when he's on his game he can be one of the best tight ends in the game, yeah. but and that's is an awful awful big uh, roadblock there and that would be his concussion history, yeah. which of course he added to last season and that might drive his price down, or might uh, disinterest teams altogether. But that is my state of the union or the state of the Browns. You think you think Cameron could maybe even go to Denver if they can't re-sign Thomas? <sighs> Julius it would, Thomas. That it is. would sure as it would sure be an ideal destination for him if he doesn't yeah. go to Atlanta. I mean, going from Hoyer and Manziel to all of a sudden Peyton Manning throwing to you. Yeah, but that's <laughs> another thing that we could talk about is uh, Peyton Manning's slip, slow, s- slow slip down the mountain. He was injured. I don't know, man. I don't know how many more years he can put in good work. And I know there's a few Peyton Manning fans that I know are my friends that are listening being like, you bite your tongue right now, sir. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sorry. This is just my opinion. I don't mean to harm anybody or insult anybody here. But that's just my thoughts on Peyton Manning. He's getting up there in age, and I'm not trying to knock the talent that Peyton Manning has because he has easily been – One of the greatest quarterbacks of this era, not named Tom Brady. Um, Actually, it's he actually has less Super Bowl rings than his kid brother Eli. Yeah, who took down his nemesis twice. Jeez, Nick, you're killing me today. Sorry, I might not have you back. (laughs) Come on, opposite attract here. Uh, You know the nationwide commercials where you know uh, Peyton Manning's like chicken parm, you taste so good. Well, I think they've. (laughs) Effectively distanced themselves from that campaign with the, oh, I would I would experience all oh, these things, Lord. but I died in an accident. Oh, those commercials! But Pee Wee always makes up. We we make up our own versions to the nationwide. Uh, and one that that Pee Wee can you Pee Wee does. Uh, Mom always liked Eli best. <laughs> oh, and then and then I always I always reply with losing feeling in my head. <laughs> oh, oh man. <laughs> oh, I wish we could have a compilation of those. Like, if you've got any more, or if Pee Wee's got any oh, more. Oh, we should record them. We should. And we'll put them on the show randomly. In random, right. Random right. spots. Um, <laughs> I don't know if there's much much more to rant on in the NFL. So, if okay. you've if you've got something, feel free to throw it out there. Uh well, the Pats did win the Super Bowl. The Pats cool. did win the Super Bowl, and I know you've got a jersey on, so I'll let you have your fun with that for a while, and I'll jump in whenever I feel. Well, f- first thing I got to do is shout out the Julian Edelman, the Kent uh, State grad. Absolutely amazing, shifty guy, and he takes big hit after big hit after big hit. Uh, and that Super Bowl, he took some big hits, and he had a hurt hip the whole time. Wes, who? Yeah, right. What, who was the other guy? The guy with the the mustache, and you know, was on. What was he on? Molly too. He got suspended in Denver. I I don't know what that was. I think. Oh man, but Edelman. Holy cow, that move down in the red zone was absolutely amazing. That little uh, spin around and then go to the other side. Yeah, not to mention flashing oh. his former quarterback skills in the uh, in the playoffs as well with the toss to 
Oh uh, yeah, Amendola. Amendola. Oh, I peed myself when that happened. <laughs> and and Pee Wee and I were jumping up and down, screaming like little girls because we were so excited for that play. Yeah, we had been waiting to see Edelman throw a ball in that fashion since he was on the pads. And he pulled it off beautifully. Oh man, he made Tom Brady look like like Manziel. <laughs> Whoa, I wouldn't go back. I wouldn't go that far. Yeah, maybe not. Sorry, Tom. That was a little cruel. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Edelman, Edelman was impressive, but um, I actually live with a diehard Patriots fan, Richie Mulhall. He works for the Stater. Good great, man. Great, Good man. great sports writer. Writer, and he uh, pointed out to me the rise of Danny Amendola, particularly in the playoffs. Do you have anything to say about that? Because I know, yeah. I know Amendola was primarily brought in to replace Wes Welker after he had left for Denver, and uh, up until the playoffs this year, had relatively underwhelmed. During his time with the Pats, well, do you mind? Do you mind? Uh, I think it really came down to him finally being healthy. I he'd been off the field so much. It's hard to learn the plays and get the gel with a quarterback when you're off the field so much. Right. And I mean, with Edelman uh, showing his talent, I think they used Edelman less and less in the slot, which means they need someone in the slot. So who are you going to plug in? Amendola, perfect for that. Right, you know, I mean, LaFell was out there wide every now and then, but they used Edelman mostly out wide. And that's another thing too; they've really upgraded their receiving core. I mean, Edelman's always been there. Um, the The acquisition of LaFell, who I liked when he was in Carolina, was a good pickup. Mm -hmm. Um, Of course, Gronk was Gronk. Oh yeah. Um, uh, You know, running back uh, in the backfield wise, I think that was a good. Oh, that, that was, was a good so unit. Great. That was I, a good unit, Even too. with Ridley going down at the beginning of the year. Seven Ridley, Shane season. Vereen, um, LeGarrette Blunt eventually. The victory Blunt. <laughs> Jonas Gray, who apparently had a stellar game and then just kind of dropped off the face of the earth. We didn't even need him after that game, really. I guess. I, I know. Um, and apparently, according Bold. to the mock draft board, you guys are taking uh, Todd Gurley, too. So you can't be... forget Bolden, either. Bolden, yeah. Another man. running back. And he's great on special teams. He laid some guys out on <laughs> special teams. Yeah. A little running back. Not to mention um, Malcolm Butler laying out uh, da, uh, Lockett for the Seattle seat. Like, yeah, when they I look, both when had I, a right to that ball. When I look at that play, I just see, well, first of all, the interception was incredible. Oh, God. But the first oh. thing that came, stood out to me was uh, Lockett coming over the middle and then Bo- uh, Butler getting in there to get the interception and Lockett mm-hmm. just – gets destroyed. You just see him fly off the screen. You know, it's funny. They were talking to Butler earlier in the week. Right. And they ran that play in practice, and Butler got beat, and Belichick was let him have it in practice on that play when he got beat. So Ooh. one thing he said is that when they called him on the field, you can hear the coach uh, yell, three corners, three corners. So Butler starts running on the field. It's in the NFL film version of the Super Bowl, which I actually watched twice today. Uh, huh. it, it was great. Um and he comes onto the field, and he said he was thinking, I cannot get beat on this again. Coach will have my, my butt. Yeah. And, and, you know, sure enough, he came through with it, just like – because he had gotten beat in it in practice so many times. Well, I mean, he can uh, partially thank Pete Carroll or Daryl Bevel or Russell Wilson for that because I don't know – I don't oh, know man. who – I don't know who had the final say in that play call, but I doubt it was Wilson. It has to be Carroll. Carroll has to take the blame for that. Because, one, you're a head coach. At that point in the game, every play is going to go through you. It is your responsibility to either stick with it or to change the play. And you are the head coach. So when your team fails, it really reflects on you. And you gotta, you got to take that blame as I mean, the head coach. That sounds about right, but I just don't know what... what I mean, maybe that theory that maybe they didn't want to pay Lynch is correct. Oh, no way. I, I, don't, know, I don't know why on, on earth you would bypass arguably the best short yardage back in the game for a pass a a risky pass at the one yard line when you don't have a lot of space to work with i think at that point you were just trying to win the super bowl you don't care who's getting paid i mean pete carroll's not writing the checks and they had had issues with lynch all year yeah but it'd be less trouble for him if they if he went free agent and left but i I mean even if you do give the ball to Lynch, I mean, if you're not, if you don't want to pay him, then don't pay him. Let him go somewhere else. Yeah. Because you've got you've got guys like Todd Gurley, you've got guys like Melvin Gordon, and if last year's draft is any indication where Jeremy Hill and Bishop Sankey didn't even go until the second round, 
you can wait on a running back. Yeah. I don't know. I think it was just I, – I, I'd like to thank Pete Carroll personally for that play call. Right. <laughs> and I would just – I mean, I'd like to go into the Jermaine Curse catch. Oh, we can. We'll, we'll do it after this break. That was amazing. We'll get into that catch. Right. The catch that tore my heart in half, and then Butler sewed it back together. <laughs> All right, listen to Black Squirrel Radio. It's not your typical Fairweather. I like the songs we're coming in on. This is a, it's a pretty stellar selection. Well, it's, it's the new stuff I got to play. All right. I would have probably picked harder stuff, in all honesty. <laughs> I picked the Green Day one, so you can thank me for that, I guess. New Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductees. Oh, yeah, I voted for them. Unless I don't know if that counts or if it was just a poll. But. Right. Uh, but anyway, uh, if you're just joining us, ladies and gentlemen, we are talking Super Bowl. We were talking Super Bowl for a little bit, uh, specifically the final play that has been mired in controversy. <laughs> it's beautiful. And we are going to go – we're going to rewind a little bit to the play right before it or somewhat near it. I think it was the play before it. The I'm play sure. that broke New England's heart. But then... Or hot. Hot. Um, yes, what, we're, uh, what he just referenced was Jermaine Curse's, uh, I think, circus is a bit of an understatement. Oh, circus catch. Geez. I don't know how... I, I honestly don't know how it happened because I was celebrating, as I'm sure 99% of you were, when... 99% of Patriots fans, that is, were celebrating after Curse supposedly had dropped the ball, but apparently mm-hmm. it hit off his body a couple of times, hit off his legs, and somehow... Every hand and every foot. Every hand and every foot, and somehow he hangs on to it, makes that catch, and my goodness, the first thing I thought was the oh, he did what catch? Oh, the helmet catch. Yeah, that's what I thought of. Not uh, no, not the Tyree. There was one back in the late '90s. I can't remember who made it. Really? Um, I think it was a pa- it was a Packers receiver, and they were playing the Vikings. And I it bounces off his body, and he's on the ground. He catches it, and the announcers immediately like he did what? <laughs> but that that play was running through my mind as I saw as I saw um, that play unfold. But then the next play afterwards, Seattle, the entire city of Seattle is up in arms. They're ready to pop the champagne, and what do you know? Russell yeah. Wilson throws the ball that never should have been thrown. And they most ran people it the opinions. play before. Remember, Marshawn almost got in, but uh, who was it? Hightower and Ayers just kept him out of the end zone. Right, and which then, is a very overlooked play. Okay, so it wasn't the the play after that that catch. Then no, there was one run, and then. Uh, Everyone thought Bill Belichick was going to call it to his last time out to stop the clock, but he didn't, and the clock kept running. So you realize if you're Seattle, uh, I've got a, I only have two shots at this because I don't. But they didn't have a timeout, did they? They did. I don't think. I don't no, believe they, had, they did. They had one timeout, so they could stop the clock once. If they ran it, uh, tried to run it three times, they were going to run it, call a timeout, they were going to run it, and the Pats weren't going to get off them. If he didn't get in the end zone, we were going to dogpile him and knock it up because they wouldn't have been able to stop the clock. Right. So, you know, the throwing thing, they were saying it was to stop the clock. Uh, but, I mean, I still I would have ran it, and then I would have called the timeout, and then I would have been like, this last run is going to be the ball game. I would have even I would have even spiked the ball after the first initial run after the timeout. Yeah, you could have done that too. And then I think Bill, Belichick threw Carroll off. The one that's th- what I've heard. Yeah. That's why it didn't, you know, it didn't look right. Yeah, I mean the one thing the one thing that I would have done is probably substituted Lynch, like had Lynch in the backfield but had like a double reverse to Michael Tur or Christine Michael or Turbin yeah, that's or That's risky. Whatever it is. Like just a just a trick play because mm-hmm. I mean if everybody can say like oh maybe you should have run it in that play then of course, the Pats would have been thinking that it would have been Marshawn that was coming. Oh yeah, oh play action would have even been. Oh, play action would have been bit better. Probably least, would have been the best. They should one. have at the very least had Marshawn in there, right in, in the backfield because I mean you, you don't even have to do the play action. They see Marshawn back there, they're going to assume he's probably going to get the ball. Right at the one yard line. Yeah, like and and oh. as a, and as elusive a QB as Russell Wilson is, you don't mm-hmm. think that he 
may have faked the hand off the lynch, kept it, maybe run it in for himself. Yeah, even that might have worked. He can roll out a little bit if no one's open. That quick slant doesn't work with those smaller guys. But oh. worked out pretty well for you and every yeah. other Patriots fan. I was personally rooting for the Patriots myself. Thank you. Because uh, I know I have a lot of friends, you're, you you're, included, obviously. You're my favorite co-host. <laughs> the favorite. Only. My favorite co-host I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's. I feel like it was kind of like karma for the the Tyree catch. I, I guess, and like that. Oh, that hurt. That one stings. That one does sting. And I know, I knew they were gonna play a replay of that after Curse's catch. Oh yeah, and they mentioned it, and they still they keep showing it still, and it still hurts. I know I've got, I know my team's got four, four rings, but it still hurts to be that close. To know that you could have had you, five. I mean, wouldn't Browns fans, Browns fans, don't you want to see the Patriots match the Steelers in rings so the Steelers fans can shut up? Come on. Yeah. Like us, we're you yeah. know we're not as bad as Pittsburgh fans, us New Englanders. Yeah, uh, I would on. admit, I would admit that. I would rather, I'd rather it be you guys match the Steelers than the 49ers. Yeah. Personally, I yeah. would. I don't know. It's just something about Kaepernick I don't like. Oh yeah, he's, he's overrated. And he stole Alex Smith's job. Right. Even though Alex Smith still deserved to have it. And Alex Smith's got a pretty decent job up there in KC anyway with a guy named Andy yeah, Reid. Yes, I've I've loved Alex Smith now. I used to not like him, thought he was overrated, but he's really coming to his own. But anyway, let's move on to um <laughs> the <laughs> the closing moments of the Super Bowl before the kneel down, the fight. Oh, Bruce boy. Irvin frustrated as I'm sure a lot of those players were Bruce Irvin decides to go through the line and just start swinging yeah, it was I it actually made me mad because they were such like I had the utmost respect for the Legion of Boom and that Seattle defense I love watching defenses light people up and pick off balls and I I like the Legion of Boom uh granted I was rooting for the Pats but like I you've got you've got to Seattle respect you, you've got to respect him. the secondary. Oh yeah, and I, I don't think it falls on the Legion of Boom because Bruce Irvin is a linebacker, and when most people think the Legion of Boom, they think of the secondary as opposed to the linebackers. Oh, I just think the entire defensive squad. When I think it, maybe maybe that's not right, but that's what I think of when I hear Legion of Boom. Uh, but, but. Um, I have to admit, I know we covered this earlier in the show, but uh, Richard Sherman really earned some respect. Yeah. Um, by being the first man to congratulate Tom Brady. And I know that they had their run-in a few years ago where the infamous You Mad Bro meme came. Mm -hmm. And Uh, In the the little NFL film of the Super Bowl that I watched today, uh, they have the audio from the meeting of Brady and Sherman, and they were both complimented on how talented each other are. Yeah, and I thought that was really classy of Sherman and Brady, and that was really was classy. A, it was probably one of my favorite moments in the Super Bowl, other than that pick, was seeing Sherman be a gracious winner, right, or a uh, loser. I thought, oh, that's kind of a harsh word. I guess runner-up. He was a gracious runner-up. He, he was gracious in defeat. Let's put it that way. Although it did look like he was going to cry at that one point. And well, I, I mean, I, I, I would too. To be so oh. close to getting a Super Bowl, a second straight <laughs> Super Bowl, um. And just having it snatched out of your hands quite literally by Malcolm Butler. Not single handedly, but you know what I mean. They gotta have a a little like gif or gif of it where Sherman goes from that uh the face to the almost cry face and then the audio from a Christmas story. What are you gonna cry for me? Cry. They need uh, to make that. Uh or we need to make that and have it on the show. <sighs> Whenever you, I, I would be. I whenever be, you're upset with the Browns or the Cavs, we'll I, play it for you. I wouldn't be opposed to that. <laughs> um, yeah, the bra. I mean, who got fined? It was Gronk. It was Gronk, and the, Irvin, the, and Hamalama Louie or whatever. Hamalama Louie, and, and I think Bennett was in there too. Okay, was it Bennett? I know there was I two thought, and two. I thought it was Bennett. Yeah, I mean, I agree with the fines. Uh, I didn't see the Pats actually take a swing. Uh, I just saw right. two. Two Seattle players actually take swings, and I saw Pat's players, uh, Gronk especially, and the our other tight end, uh, my I just call him Mike. I can't pronounce the big long last name. They right. they threw Seattle players to the ground, which isn't as bad as the swing, but it's still bad. But I mean, the whole thing was started with the Irvin thing. Right, and right. You get thrown out of the Super Bowl. 
in the last yeah. couple seconds after you just lost, basically. Yeah. That's, holy cow. I mean, it's oh, let, let's just say he was the anti Sherman. Yeah. He really was, and everybody's perception of uh, Sherman and uh, uh, from last year the rant mm. and everything else to see Sherman go out with such class and Irvin. Although I do recall when he was drafted by the Seahawks, them t- them uh, saying that he had a bit of an attitude. Yeah, I can, I can see that. You know, he was a wide receiver in college. I did not know that. Yeah, I, I, I don't didn't. know if he was his entire career, but he at least started out as a wide receiver. Imagine that luck throwing the Sherman. Huh. Oh, I thought you were talking about Bruce Irvin. Oh no, sh- no, Richard Sherman. Oh, okay. You yeah, can that, see that, that a little that, bit that more. Makes, that. that makes sense. Yeah. As like a linebacker lining up as a wide receiver, something's not right. Hey, here. Gronk does it. Gronk did do it. Yeah, Irvin right. could have been a tight end. So, right, yeah, right. You know, Gronk can do it. Although Gronk is a beast. So. Um, yeah, but I mean, it doesn't surprise me that Richard Sherman would line up on the opposite side of the ball, much like they've been saying about uh, Patrick Peterson. Oh yeah, um, he's pretty good. Oh, he's really good. But yeah, that was a very thrilling Super Bowl. Uh, the commercials were a bit. Underwhelming. Uh, dis- very disappointing. Very disappointing. Except the for best that. one was like the band one that GoDaddy couldn't air. Yeah. Did you see that one? I, I didn't see it. Uh, you know the Budweiser one where the puppy finds his way home? Oh, yeah. GoDaddy yeah. did the same thing, and then at the end when the puppy finally finds its way home, the lady picks him up and says, Okay, ship him out, and she's running a puppy mill. Oh. And uh, the SPCA got really upset about it and said, Oh, GoDaddy, what do you think? Puppy mills are funny? <sighs> and it's a commercial. It's not. They're not supporting puppy mills. It's a funny commercial going after another one. Because the Super Bowl commercials lately have been really soft. They either tug at your heart or make you feel sad lately. They're not a lot yeah. of funny ones. So they're making fun of how all of a sudden the beer commercials go from like the Magic Fridge one and like the funny ones, and then the ones with the frogs. To all of a sudden, those ones that pull at your heartstrings. See, my favorite one. reaction. My favorite one. My favorite like set of um, the Bud Light commercials were the ones where um, they gave people like superpowers during the two thousand two thousand eight Super Bowl. Pat's Giants. Oh. Uh, okay. The ability to fly, ability to oh, breathe fire, yeah. the ability to talk to animals was my favorite because all the dog would say was sausages. <laughs> I love the magic fridge one. The magic fridge was good, too. Oh, the magic fridge is back, and they all run to the fridge, taking as many beers out as they can. And the the Pepsi Max uh. the Pepsi Max ad was good that year, too. Mm-hmm. The one with um, What is Love by Hathaway, and they're all, like, dancing, and then... Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> so, um, just, if anybody, I don't know, there are probably no big companies with advertising list advertisers listening here but make your super bowl commercials funnier yeah you got to spend so much money on them uh one way to get your money's worth is to make people really remember them and the one way in the right in the, in the right humor. In, the, in the right way yeah you got to make them humor. remember it in the right way we remember things that are funny like i remember the magic fridge commercial and that was like 10 years ago my oh and another underrated one was the doritos one with the rat with the uh, mouse hole Oh, the yeah. one where he leaves the Dorito outside the mouse hole, and then there's like a giant guy in a mouse suit tackles him. Oh, I remember that one. Yeah, that was good. Oh, uh, all right. Well, I think we can sit here and reminisce about our favorite Super Bowl commercials all show all day long. Uh-huh. Unfortunately, we've got a time schedule to stick to, so I'll kick it over to Bob and let's see what's up next. Now, I'm not really gonna bring up um, the deflated footballs because I uh, pee- right. Pee- pee- that, that, well, that that's been. You're beating a dead horse here. Yeah, I know Pee Wee's probably going to be on Pee Wee Ponder segment where my old man, uh, Pee Wee, gets on and he, he kind of rambles like an old man about something. Okay. And it, it's fun to have conversations with him because he's very intelligent sports wise, um, but he's very Bostonian. Um, uh-huh. I know he's going to mention that next week when we have him call in for a little bit. Uh, so I'm not going to get too far into it. But me being the genius that i am i've come up with a few possible reasons the patriots balls could have been deflated all right uh, and i'm gonna go ahead and read these to you guys now uh reason one uh gronk spiked all the balls before the game started to test which one he wanted to spike the most ha uh next vince Woolfork sucked some of the air out of the balls to properly inflate himself <laughs> yeah uh, 
Next, Josh Gordon snuck into the room and tried to get high off the air inside the balls. <laughs> uh, uh, next one, Aaron Hernandez broke out of prison and shanked some of the balls in frustration of missing a Super Bowl. I didn't see that one. <laughs> I don't know when I added that one. Uh, another one, Brady felt bad for Aaron Rodgers and took some of the air out of the balls just to distract from Bre Green Bay's monumentous collapse. Right. Okay. Uh, the refs took some of the air out of the balls to distract from their poor play calling in the NFC games. Okay. And the last but not least reason I think some of the air came out of the balls, Tim Tebow prayed the air away. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, when we come back, we're going to talk uh, probably about the hottest topic in Cleveland right now. Uh, well, it was before last name, last night's game. We're going to talk about the Cavs. Oh, uh, don't spoil it. Oh. All right. Don't spoil it. We'll I think everyone has spoiled it last night when they watched the game. There are some people that don't watch. Oh, well. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> I've watched two games, the Celtics game and last night's game. So. Right. Oh, I watched the season opener, too. But anyway, we've got to get going here, so I think we'll take a quick commercial break here. And Yeah, last commercial break. Uh, but before we leave, uh, hey, listeners, do you wish you could take the magic of BSR anywhere? Do you have a smartphone you never put down? If so, we have awesome news for you. Black Squirrel Radio now has a mobilized website, so you can check us out even when you're not around the computer. Just go to www.blacksquirrelradio.com on your iPhone, Droid, or other mobile device to see it. Our audio stream and webcam are only a touch away, so you can listen and watch BSR wherever you are. In the car, at the gym, and at cool parties. No clunky computers, apps, or media players to worry about. Check out the mobilized www.blacksquirrelradio.com right Hey there, ladies and gentlemen. This is Nick, the Candyman Hershey, coming at you here. We are in the final segment of still not your typical Fairweather sports show. I, of course, am new to this particular game. Uh, Boston Bob's been bringing you all the sports action of the last week alone for quite some time, and he's done a pretty dang good job of it, but I'm just here to back him up. Aww. But, ladies and gentlemen... If you haven't tuned into my show before, The Gauntlet, which we have, uh, my co-host and I have taken a break from it over the semester. That's why I'm here right now. Um, I'm actually the co-sports director here at Black School Radio, and it has afforded me some of the greatest opportunities that I've ever had in my short life. Um, I actually have had the opportunity to broadcast some hockey games. Well, not broadcast them, but just to get a free seat to the hockey game and kind of supervise my broadcasters of one of which is Bob, yeah. and he does a phenomenal job. And uh, I'm proud to say that they ended their season, their regular season, with a win, 5-2 to two, over John Carroll University, and I wish them the best of luck in the postseason. Um, Coach Underwood's a wonderful guy, and I've had the chance to talk with him, and he, he has uh, gone above and beyond to make sure we have been able to broadcast his games effectively, and the team has been nothing but supportive of us. So thank you, gentlemen, for all your help. It has been an honor to broadcast your games. And right now, actually tonight, getting to business at hand, tonight uh, the Golden Flashes take on Miami of Ohio in the Max Center tonight at 7 which I will be your play-by-play -play man. I'll be giving you all the action as it happens, and I will be with my good friend and play-by or uh, color commentator Brett B. Dot Frost. He comes to us from California, so he's a very excitable guy. He's a perfect candidate to be a color commentator, and I cannot wait to work with him for the very first time. Of course, we have a lot of very talented and great broadcasters here at BSR Sports. And I have the honor, the pleasure of being the co-sports director here. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We are now going to return to our final segment here, which I will be taking over here. And it revolves around the Cleveland Cavaliers. Now, I know I've talked to you. I know that uh, Bob and I have made it clear to all of you that I am a diehard Cleveland sports fan. But I've got something to tell you. I just went to my first Cavs game. 
Really? Last week. Your first one. My first one. I've been um, to more Cavs games than you have then. You have something up on me then. Huh. Um, I actually went, it was actually a gift from a JMC alum um, who gifted us actually first energy suites, and I had the opportunity to Ooh. represent the station uh, along with the general manager, Alyssa Haberman, as we went to the Cavs Kings game on January 30th. And I have to, I have to tell you, it was an amazing experience that I'll never forget. And um, I just want to thank uh, Thor Wasbot, director of the JMC, and uh, Mrs. Uh, Ms. Gretchen Sekulich, who donated the suites. That was an awesome experience. And um, thank you to, of course, Alyssa Haberman for giving me the lift to the stadium because I don't think I'd be able to walk that distance. <laughs> um, you should but, have gave her a lift and talked her into giving you a raise. <laughs> Gotta play well, leverage, Nick. I'm leverage. just on, I'm just honored to be here and have the job. I, money, uh, money's just a side thing. It's 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 a nice perk, but it's not what it's about. It's you, about. Are you single, Nick? Yes. All the ladies out there, Nick just said money's a side thing. What a guy. Yeah. You know, he's here at the studio but, for the next uh, half hour, twenty minutes. Yes, but it's it's just about having the experience. But let's get on to our final segment here. Uh, the Cleveland Cavaliers have been the NBA's hottest team as of late, um, until last night, that is. They had their streak snapped 99-103 to against a division opponent, the Indiana Pacers. And um, like I said, I had the opportunity to see a Cavs win, their ninth straight win at the time against the Sacramento Kings. And I, this has been really a roller coaster season for them, because in the summer they had LeBron James coming back, which was the big story coming out of the summer, and then, well, first, first before LeBron even came back, we won the number one overall pick for the second year in a row, which I don't know how it happens. We're just I don't know. We're just lucky. Cleveland um, lucky a one point set a one point seven percent chance of landing the first overall pick and we get it, um, and we drafted uh, Kansas swingman and rookie f- sensation now Andrew Wiggins, and then Kevin Love. Oh, I <laughs> don't get me wrong. I like Kevin Love. I I I can appreciate what he's done for the NBA as a player, but I really a part of me really wanted to see Andrew Wiggins stay with Cleveland. But I realized that this team is win now mode. They had to make the move that they did, and I'd like to think that both parties have uh, benefited from the move. Um, no, I, I think so too. Uh, Minnesota gets its future star, and we get our third piece to combine our big three, make our big three. And things didn't start off so well. We lost to the Knicks in our home opener, <laughs> and then we went on. We were just up and down, and then came this 12-game winning streak where now we've made believers out, about, out of just about everybody in the NBA, and now it's finally over. Um, my thoughts about that, I mean, it, it's got to happen at some point. I'd rather it be now than in the finals when it's in Game 7 and we have to win. Um I think this. I think we are going to the playoffs, as opposed to speculation before the winning streak began, where they may not even make the playoffs. But they have, they've really stepped it up in the last few, uh, this last stretch of games, the last twelve to be exact. And I think that can be mostly attributed to the midseason trades that they made, uh, getting rid of Dion Waiter, sending him to OKC, and uh, getting. J.R. Smith and Amon Shumpert from the Knicks. But more importantly, and Bob, I know you had this listed as one of your keys here, uh, the acquisition of Timofey Mozgov from oh, the Denver yeah. Nuggets, who has been just an absolute sensation. And you know what, ladies and gentlemen, I was, uh, was a bit nervous when he came to town because all I could, all I remember seeing was Sports Nation posting a picture of him getting posterized by Blake Griffin when he was a part of the Knicks. So wasn't too happy about that. Um, but he has come in and done his job very, very well. Oh, and I think, personally, I think Tristan Thompson's on his way out after this season. Um, I don't know why. he's turned He turned down a pretty good offer from the Cavs last season in the off season to stay in Cleveland. I don't know what that means exactly, uh, if he's going to leave or not. I do think he is. 
but that will give Anderson Verjao the opportunity to start or uh, back up Kevin Love at the power forward position if that does happen. Um, as far as the draft is concerned, I think we need to draft either a backup uh, shooting guard or a backup center because Mozgov has clearly proven that he can start at this level and be productive. See, one one thing I like about Mozgov, um, his his rebound numbers aren't that high. Only averaging three point three on offense and five point two on defense, uh, where Kevin Love leading the team with ten point five. But as you you could see last night, it's his ability to change the shooter's shot, uh, so right. that they they have to shoot from a non like a not high percentage kind of shot. They have to change their layup. Uh, they don't have open slots to the lane. Right. I think just his presence in there makes the Cavs a much better team too. He was the ideal rim protector that they needed. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, there was speculation that they were going to go after guys like JaVale McGee and Roy Hibbert. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is Roy Hibbert probably would have commanded too much money. And JaVale McGee isn't really probably best known for his dunk contest appearance. We needed somebody that could protect the rim on defense, and Mozgov fits that that mold to a T. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you look at the Celtics when they won it all, uh, you had the big three, uh, and then you had Perkins. Down low, he didn't need to score. He just needed to be that defensive presence. I think Mozgov is that for the Cavs. Well, I mean, Mo- Mozgov can defend, but he can also score as well. I mean, I've seen but him. You don't even need him to. You don't. Like, yeah, you don't. Part. You don't even need him to, but he can. And I mean, I've seen a lot of alley oop plays where Mozgov's on the receiving end, and he can just elevate over just about anybody without oh, yeah. getting off the ground too much. Yeah. And I, I think part of the reason that the, they lost to the Pacers was that you had a battle of the Giants down low, Mozgov versus Roy Hibbert. And I know that with Paul George down, the pressure's been on Hibbert to produce. And, I mean, he has. And I don't I don't see the Pacers making the playoffs, not that kind of production. Nah. But if you can negate Mozgov in any way, and it, it's it's odd to say that shutting down Mozgov would be the key to beating the Cavs, but the fact of the matter is the mat, uh, the reason that we started out so poorly, at least in my d- opinion, was because we weren't really defensive-oriented. We had Our big three was a mainly offensive, um, offensive-guided trio aside from LeBron James, mm-hmm. and I think once Mozgov came to town, uh, they saw his defensive intensity and it's amazing how one guy, the defensive anchor, if you want to call him that, can really energize an entire team. But that's what Mozgov brings to the table. Yeah, and I agree. Now, if you're a Cavs fan, do you want to see Kevin Love get more involved in this offense? I mean, as long as we keep winning, it doesn't matter. As long as he doesn't turn the ball over or do anything negative, mm-hmm. I think a lot of people are expecting a lot of him because we gave up so much to get him. And especially the guy, I think a lot of people were envisioning the guy in Minnesota as the guy that we were getting. But you've got to understand, Kevin Love was the only option in Minnesota. Exactly. He, did not, he didn't have a secondary score. The offense ran through him. The offense runs through Kyrie and LeBron now. LeBron uh, probably is number one there. Uh, Kyrie's probably number two. Well, probably he is number two. And then that leaves... Kevin Love is the Chris Bosh of the trio, if I can compare it to the Miami Heat. Yeah, I would. Because he can rebound. He has the outside shot that Bosh developed. I mean, it's unfair to compare them uh, literally, but mm-hmm. um, figuratively saying, I mean, yeah, you can compare Love to Bosh. And, I mean, he'll make he'll get rebounds for you. He'll shoot from the outside. He's just He's just that kind of guy that gets you over the hump, and that's – that's all we really need. Now, one last thing I want to add is that when the Miami Heat uh, got together with their big three, it was basically the big two for a while. It was Wade and LeBron. It took Bosch a little while to get going. I think Love's going to be the same way. When teams finally shut down Braun and, and Kyrie, I guarantee Love's going to step up and be that leading scorer for those games. That's a very good theory. I, I agree with you 100%. But that'll, pro- that'll just about do it for our show. Um, once again, thank you for tuning in, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'd actually like to apologize for Johnny Manziel. I thought my comments about him were a bit over the line. and I thought they were fine. Shape up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, sorry, Johnny, if you are listening. Right. Uh, sincerest of apologies. Thank you for listening, everybody. Um, again, thank you for giving me such a warm introduction to the show, Bob. Thank you. 
No problem. It's going to be an honor to have this, to be a part of the show with you for the rest of the semester. Anytime. I appreciate it. Next up is Buzzcat Monroe for some awesome reggae. Stay tuned. Buzzcat is awesome. I love this guy. We broadcast with him, actually. We do. He's Stay a great tuned. broadcaster. This was not your typical Fairweather sports show. You're listening to Black.